Uh, thanks very much and welcome to Keeble College, which is, by the way, for those of you who don't know, the answer to the riddle, which Oxford College dining hall is longer than, Balliol, uh, longer than Christ Church and older than Balliol? Uh, and the reason why it's longer than Christ Church was when they built it here, they measured Christ Church and added a foot on it. <laughs> the reason why it's older than Balliol is Balliol, Balliol has a new one. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the flexible city, which is the theme of the Oxford programme for the future of cities, of which I am, as Jenny has told you, co-director. And we have four main topical areas uh, under that programme. One is new modes of governance, looking at new ways of running cities. Uh, the second is everyday life in the city, particularly looking at issues of inequality, equality and access to the city and to city spaces. The third is city-to-city -city learning, which is direct contacts between cities not mediated by national governments, by which cities actually spread uh, and share information uh, about themselves and how they run themselves. And then the fourth one, which is the one I'm going to focus on today, which is uh, looking at infrastructure and mundane technology uh, and the role of technology in shaping uh, the city. We are currently in the middle of the biggest migration in human history the biggest migration in human history, and that is the migration of people from the countryside into the city. Uh, we've already passed the 50% mark, where half the world's population lives in cities, and we're on track probably by mid-century to something where we will have 70-75% uh, of the world's population uh, living in cities. And I put it to you that this is actually really good news. Cities, unfortunately, get a bum rap. But they're actually good for people, and they're good for the environment. The reason why the cities get a bum rap is because people tend to focus on the concentration of human activity and human impacts in the city without thinking about the per capita uh, attribution of those impacts and also about how that concentration actually gives people much better access to many of the things that make up what is for them the good life. So uh, rather than focusing on the total output of the pollution from cities, if we actually look at pollution in, ur in urban and rural areas, per capita, people pollute much worse in the countryside than they do in the city. They drive further distances. Uh, they're using agricultural chemicals and other things, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, natural hazards, industrial hazards, human health, all of these are better in the city than in the countryside. Agricultural injuries are at a much higher rate than urban industrial injuries. Um, Crime, violence, and suicide. Suicide rates tend to be much higher in rural areas than in urban areas. Uh, and crime, although you look at the overall crime figures in cities and you, you sort of go, go ouch, uh, actually per head of the population, there is lower crime uh, usually in cities, at least uh, in, uh, in the dwellings. I can't speak necessarily for the bankers' boardrooms um, than there is in the urban area. And poverty. Cities do not make people poor. Poor people flock to cities because cities are actually good places to be poor, because actually that's where you stand the best chance of getting out, climbing out of poverty. So cities are good for us. We also know that they're centres of creativity. Some of you may have read books by um, uh, recent bestseller, Ed Glazer, The Triumph of the City, Richard Florida's The Creative Class, and you'll know from reading those books that the concentration of population, the ability to communicate with your neighbours, uh, the, the probability of having a chance encounter where you can bring two ideas together and make something new out of them, much, much higher where you have the population density of the city uh, than elsewhere. And, you know, one of the little exercises you could go through, for example, maybe we'll try it, is, uh, you know, let's think about a couple of cities that have been very flexible. New York City started out as a port, uh, it became uh, a centre of the garment trade, it became a, centre, uh, a financial centre. Uh, think of Boston, went through similar transitions. Even Pittsburgh was a, was a steel city and a coal city that transformed into being uh, a city centred on health technology and uh, information technology. Three examples of flexible city. Now think of Detroit. Not really an example that we think of when we think about flexibility and the ability to reinvent yourself. What is it that the first three cities have that Detroit doesn't have? Anybody? Think about it a moment. I bet you could all name a university in New York. I bet you could all name a university in, in Boston, well, Cambridge. Uh, uh, you can probably name 
one of the two good, great universities in Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon. Can anybody name a university in Detroit? No. So there's a clue right there. The, the extent to which those first three cities actually invested in higher education turns out to be a very important correlate of their uh, ability to be flexible. Cities, there, there's a popular phrase these days, it's, it's popular to talk about knowledge cities and connect particular cities to IT, but cities have always been knowledge cities. Cities have always been centres of creativity and of knowledge. There are crossroads, they're the places where universities happen, libraries are there, uh, you have uh, major intersections of communication uh, and so on and so forth. But there's a paradox. And that's, despite all this creativity, as soon as you start to lay down physical infrastructure in cities, you start to set patterns that persist for tens, hundreds, even thousands of years. This is a map of uh, London, the city of London, just the city, uh, with part of the Roman wall and uh, some of the Roman roads marked on it. And you can see, in fact, how the Romans shaped contem the contemporary city of London uh, in very meaningful ways. And that applies to most major European cities, Paris being the notable exception, of course, because that was entirely demolished uh, uh, and rebuilt. Um, so you have that physical lock-in that can last, as I say, for... Uh, certainly in the case of London, something like 1,400 years. Uh, but it's not just a physical lock-in, it's also an ideational lock-in. We are locked into a particular idea of what the morphology of the city should be. This is an artist's impression of Ur of the Chaldees, uh, the city from which uh, Abraham uh, set forth in the, in the Bible. Uh, and you can see here the, sort of the, the classic arrangement. You have the, the ritual and power center of the city in the middle here. You've got this big ziggurat, the temple, uh, over there, that would probably be a bank today. Um, and then you have the, uh, uh, the commercial uh, areas, the public squares, and then the housing and so on, and then in the distance the port, very important, and then the agricultural hinterland beyond that. And so you can force fast forward, um, you know, three, 4,000 years to today, and you'll see that really uh, only the god has changed in that period. Uh, you still have the central uh, architectural feature representative of the political uh, uh, power and the, uh, the power of... Uh, the economic power of the city, uh, and the same kind of general, uh, general shape. Um, and I think what I'm trying to do here is to highlight the importance of two concepts. One is lock-in, and the other is path dependency. And I'm going to talk a little bit about both of those and then apply them to the city. Um, you're all familiar with this sequence of letters, right? You all know what it is? It's the top line of the English standard keyboard. Does anybody know why that's the top line of the standard English keyboard? Why the keyboard doesn't go A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Gentlemen at the, one of the gentlemen at the back. Slow down, so it's exactly. At the end of the 19th century, when the typewriter was invented, typists were too good. They typed too fast, and the keys jammed. So to, so to slow them down, some bright spark said, let's distribute the letters around differently, so that'll slow them down. And that's why we came up with this. Now, when I first started working at the Oak Ridge National Lab, one of the US's leading um, technology uh, institutes back in 1983, uh, I had one of these things on my desk on the left. That's an IBM Golf Bowl typewriter. Now, the first thing that I call to your attention is no keys. OK, it's a golf ball technology. It still has the QWERTY UEOP uh, keyboard. Uh, within two or three years, uh, my beloved IBM Selectric was replaced by the thing on the right, an Apple II computer. Uh, not only no keys um, uh, in, on the printing end, but actually no printing capability built into that device whatsoever. Still the QWERTY keyboard. And if any of you have got a laptop in the room, gentleman over there uh, with his Mac on his lap knows full well that's exactly what he's looking at. Now, why are we still using the QWERTY keyboard? Any thoughts? Because that's, that's what's usually taught. It's not just the keyboard, okay? It's not just the physical piece of technology. It's the embeddedness of the technology in a whole lot of social and other uh, institutional kinds of factors. Secretarial schools, typing manuals, touch typing courses, uh, and these kinds of things. Which mean that we stick with things long, long after the reason why we started doing them uh, has gone away. So that's one example. That's the QWERTY keyboard. Uh, and... There's lots of analysis in the social sciences, by the way, about how, how you get into th this lock-in. There's very, very little understanding about how you unlock things deliberately once you've got locked in. And that's one of the things we're interested in uh, in this research program on the future of cities. 
I also want to talk about a related concept. It's not quite the same thing as lock-in. It's path dependency. Um, would any of you be surprised if I told you that there was actually a causal relationship that you can trace back between the size of the boosters that were used to send the space shuttle into orbit and a Roman war chariot? Anybody, would you be surprised? Do you want to hear the story? Yes. You want to hear the story? Okay. The boosters that sent the shuttle into orbit were built by a firm called Morton Thiokol in the Midwest of the United States. They had to be transported to the launch site at Cape Kennedy, Cape Canaveral in Florida, and to do that they had to go through railroad tunnels. So the maximum diameter of the booster was dictated by the size of the existing railroad tunnels. Now then that raises the question, why were the railroad tunnels the size they were? They were the size they were because they were built on the basis of the English uh, of the, the, the gauge, standard gauge for railways, um, which in the US is the same as the English gauge, four foot seven, I forget what it is, it's some, some bizarre, uh, bizarre uh, number. Uh, and why were the American railways built uh, on that gauge? Because they were built by English railroad engineers. Why were the English railroad engineers building their railways on that gauge, and not, by the way, on Brunel's seven foot gauge, which would have been vastly superior technologically? Why were they building it on that gauge? Because the first trucks that were used in English railways were old mining trucks, um, which were on rails to drag coal out of the mine. Uh, and they had this particular axle length. Why did the mining trucks have that particular axle length? Because they had been originally built on jigs that were designed to build carts. Why did carts in England have that particular axle length? Um, going back to medieval times. Well, they standardized the axle length because they wanted to standardize, because they were standardizing the, uh, the grooves in the road. You must remember that these were unmade up roads, so they had ruts in them. And you didn't want to be uh, with one of your wheels in a rut and one out of a rut because you'd end up breaking your wheels, so you're better off having a standardized fit into the ruts. But why were medieval carts that width and, and, and so on? Well, actually, it's because, of course, the medieval cart was based on the Roman war chariot, um, and uh, this was the axle length of the Roman war chariot. Uh, why was the Roman war chariot having this particular axle length? Because the Roman war chariot was pulled by two horses. So you can see that the Morton Thiokol booster that sent the shuttle into space was the way it was in order to accommodate the Roman horse's ass, or ass, depending on whether you're American or British, okay? <laughs> Now, this, this may be a rather fanciful uh, or even possibly apocryphal uh, tale, but it at least establishes in your minds, I, I think in fairly indelibly, uh, the concept of path dependency, that the things we do in some sense or another can be traced back uh, to previous uh, practices and we, we get locked into them. And in thinking about technologies, I want to emphasize a couple of things and how we get locked into technology and how technology in the city is path dependency and how technology shapes the city. The first thing I want to, to emphasize is that technologies are social systems. They're not just bits of kit. Technologies are social systems that are mediated by materials and devices. In other words, we use those materials, we use those bits of kit in order to do things as human beings together in communities, in societies. That's very important. There is a false dichotomy that is often made between changing behavior and changing technology. Uh, and I put it to you that you actually don't change one without the other. If I want to change um, your behavior in some fundamental way, say, I'll be talking tomorrow about the threat of climate change in response to climate change, I'm going to have to change the technologies that you have at your disposal in order for your behavior to change. If I want to get you using more public transport, I have to provide more and better tr public transport for you to use. Uh, similarly, if I want to change technologies, I have to change the social arrangements. If I want you to install different kinds of heating systems, I have to make sure that the plumbers or the electrical engineers are trained up to be able to install and operate that, those heating uh, systems. And any of you who've tried to employ a builder to do extensions onto your home, incorporating um, some of the cutting edge technologies that are currently available, you'll know what it's like actually trying to get the builder to take them on board. They don't want to do it because that's not the way that they are accustomed to doing things. So technologies are social systems, mediated materials and devices. And the second thing is to, I want to, to inviting you to think about the city as a technology. It's a technology for living. And it's not just one technology. The city is a nest of technologies. Okay? They're nested inside each other in interesting and complicated ways. 
So let's actually look at these technologies. And by the way, third thing, we're not just talking here about big infrastructure, like railways and airports and cars. We're going to be talking about really mundane, everyday bits of technology that you and I uh, engage with. Here's an example of an early uh, shaper of the city, a technology which has done much, probably more than anything, to determine the location of cities. It's the sailing ship. And the sailing ship was, for millennia, the only sensible way to move large or bulky cargoes around. Okay? And for that reason, more than 23 of the world's largest, 30 largest cities are on the coastline. And when you start to build cities on the coastline, one of the things you do is you start to reclaim land. So a lot of the areas of these cities, increasingly Singapore, Mumbai, um, uh, so on and so forth, are actually built on reclaimed land, which is at uh, or below sea level, which, of course, uh, makes them vulnerable to storm surges uh, and, in the longer term, will make them vulnerable to climate change. Now, much of modern New Orleans, um, this is a, a recent, uh, fairly recent view still of New Orleans, um, much of modern New Orleans is, of course, at or below sea level. Not the French Quarter, where it was originally settled, by the way. That was actually above sea level and wasn't subject to this kind of level of flooding. And the flooding that happened as a result of Hurricane Katrina was not because of increased storm events, uh, intensity to, due to climate change or anything of that sort. It was a technological failure. It was a technical failure of the system of dikes uh, and levees, not of climate change. Uh, and in fact, we often hear it said that... Uh, 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 hurricanes are increasing in intensity and, and frequency. Uh, actually, if you go back 50 years in the record, there's a slight increase. If you go back in 100 years, there's no change in the record at all. What's happening is that damage costs are going up. The damage costs are going up uh, from wind and water effects of hurricane uh, exponentially. Uh, and I put it to you uh, that the reason actually isn't increased hurricane intensity is that we put a lot of our uh, urban infrastructure in silly places. Uh, this is Miami Beach today. Miami Beach is built on a barrier island. Uh, this is Miami Beach in the 1920s. Let's have a look again, shall we? Miami Beach today, Miami Beach 1920s. It's a no-brainer what's causing the increased damage costs, isn't it? All right, it's putting that stuff there. Um, now, in wealthy countries, particularly where you have urban concentrations of people, we are accustomed to dealing with the problems of uh, water intrusion, coastal uh, storm surges, etc., uh, by building major infrastructure, making big infrastructure investments. This is, of course, the Thames Barrier. Uh, actually, it's a, a beautiful uh, piece of sculpture as well as a, uh, uh, a very functional piece of technology. Uh, and this is the way in which we've been protecting uh, London from uh, these phenomena for the last few decades. Unfortunately, the, the threat is growing. That The problem is that it's not just the water that comes up the river uh, that's the threat. It's actually the uh, fluvial flooding. It's the water that accumulates behind the barrier that has nowhere to go uh, when the barrier that is down that is now uh, the major threat to London. But you can only do this in a limited number of places. Certainly, this is not an option that's available, for, for example, for Bangladesh to protect the poor in the Ganges Delta. The Ganges Delta is simply far too diffuse, besides which Bangladesh actually imports rubble. Can you get it? think about that for a moment? Bangladesh imports rubble. Other people's old demolished buildings, just for things like building and roads and stuff, because they have uh, almost no uh, indigenous supplies of stone. So these kinds of hard infrastructures are not going to be uh, useful. Now, this, on the other hand, um, is uh, also a place in Asia, in South Asia. This is actually the Tonle Sap Lake in Cambodia. And the interesting thing about the Tonle Sap Lake in Cambodia is the way in which the people who live around it have adapted to very widely fluctuating uh, lake levels. Tonle Sap is unique, by the way. The river that feeds it from the Mekong uh, River uh, actually changes direction seasonally. In the monsoon season, the river flows into the lake from the river in the uh, dry season, the water flows from the lake back out into the river again. Um, so it's, uh, it's a unique ecosystem. But what this means is the lake actually, the, the, the edge of the lake varies by several kilometers between the wet and the dry seasons. So if you build your habitation uh, on the edge of the lake in the wet season, um, in the dry season you have a very long walk, and if you built it on the edge in the, wet, in the dry season, um, in the uh, wet season you have to buy flippers and a... Uh, um, uh, and, and scuba equipment in order to uh, inhabit your home. 
Uh, and furthermore, of course, these people are very poor. They couldn't afford to buy land anyway. So their adaptation was to actually build their settlement on the lake. And these are floating villages. As you can see, they have things like churches, they have shops, uh, and all the rest of it. They're not unique to Tonle Sap. You can find uh, these elsewhere in uh, Vietnam, by the way. There's one in Hong Kong Harbor, Aberdeen Settlement, and so on and so forth. Now, the interesting thing from our point of view is that architects and engineers, and interestingly, most of all, Dutch architects and engineers, are picking up on these kinds of ideas and using modern materials, modern design techniques to adapt them to design much more flexible buildings uh, in, that could be established in areas which are prone to fluctuating water levels. Um, and I say it's interesting that it's the Dutch, because, of course, what do we think of when we think of the Dutch? We think of dikes, we think of seawalls, we think of the hardcore, heavily engineered protection uh, against flooding in, uh, in the city. Uh, we don't tend to think of this much more flexible uh, approach. And you can see here, this is a design of a house. They actually have a whole village of these houses already constructed in the Netherlands. And this is a design of a, uh, uh, an apartment complex um, that could be uh, constructed or adapted as an office complex uh, for use in urban settings, floating uh, and fluctuating with fluctuating water levels. And that's an example, just one example, of the way in which people are now deploying modern design techniques and technologies using traditional indigenous ideas in order to create a more flexible uh, urban environment. Let's look at another technology while we're on the subject of water and consider the flush toilet. Um, now, this is a technology, we rely on a technology for uh, water, um, using water to move human waste around, uh, which I can only describe as completely insane. Think about it for a moment. Who in their right minds would ever have designed a technology that purifies billions of gallons, sorry, I'm an old guy, I should say trillions of liters, I suppose, uh, uh, of water to drinking quality to flush toilets with it? 40% of the water that makes it into domestic households is used for flushing toilets. By the way, 40% of the water that leaves the reservoir doesn't even get into your, your homes or into your businesses because of, uh, in many places, not everywhere, but in many places due to uh, losses uh, in, in, in pipelines. But 40% of it uh, goes literally straight down the toilet. This is nuts. <laughs> it's a crazy system. How did it come into being? It came into being in the 19th century as an historical accident of the confluence of two uh, disconnected technological efforts. One was the effort to bring fresh, safe drinking water into the emerging cities of the Industrial Revolution. Some of you may recognize uh, the rendering here of the Broad Street Pump. You've heard the famous story about how John Snow, uh, the physician, 19th century physician, not the 20th century newsreader, uh, was supposedly took the handle off the pump because he knew that it was a, a source of waterborne infection. Um, and that was a very early attempt at public health engineering in that way. But there were the great stinks of London and Paris uh, in, the, uh, um, uh, in the 1850s. Uh, Parliament actually had to stop sitting and move somewhere else because it's, it's the river Thames just smelled so badly, uh, giving rise to this famous cartoon by Tenniel uh, of the silent highwayman, uh, the killer on the, uh, on the river Thames. So one thing that public health engineers started to do was to put sewers underground. And, of course, you had the great project of Joseph Bazalgette, who built the, the, the vast sewage system that actually runs down the embankment today. Um, and it's a memorial to his, uh, his engineering prowess and, and Victorian overbuilding uh, that, in fact, London hasn't, London's sewage system hasn't collapsed uh, completely a long time ago. So you had this first effort to put sewers underground, uh, and you had, the, sorry, the second effort, to, first effort to put sewers underground, and the second effort uh, to bring water in the cities. And it was then this piece of technology uh, that actually connected the water supply uh, with those underground sewers. Um, and along came uh, our dear friend uh, uh, Thomas Crapper, uh, who in a number of, filed a number of patents in the 1880s uh, for the siphon-operated flushing toilet. He didn't invent the flushing toilet, by the way, uh, that was a gentleman by the name of Harrington who installed one in, first in 1561 uh, for Queen Elizabeth I. But the link between um, uh, human waste management and water supply really is unsustainable in the long term. 
And this is an interesting case where uh, the collapse of existing Victorian infrastructure and the need to dig up streets and replace water supply pipes and, and sewers, the development of new development in semi-arid areas such as Southern California, this is Orange County in Southern California, uh, and the interests of the poor uh, in the less industrialized world actually co converge. And we could actually see the possibility uh, that the, that the, um, the needs of the wealthy groups in the first two instances uh, could lead to the development of a disconnection between human waste management and water supply uh, that would be of benefit to people in the developing world, where at the moment what we're doing is encouraging to install exactly this unsustainable technology uh, that links drinking water supply uh, to human waste management. And the solution uh, may well be um, uh, new technologies of dry composting toilets. And there's a lovely irony here because at the time when Thomas Crapper was filing his patent on the siphon improvements to the siphon operated flushing toilet, the Reverend Henry Mole uh, was filing patents on an earth closet, which was a dry composting system. Had it not been for the confluence of that water supply and the sewage, uh, we might today be going for a mole instead of going, never, never mind. Um, <laughs> interesting to see how technology can even shape language. Uh, Here's another everyday technology, talk, uh, story of everyday technology that shapes cities worldwide. Does anybody know this building? No, it's, it's a Lutyens, you might recognize it. It's Lutyens. Um, it's the view of the British Embassy in Washington, D.C. that you don't see from Massachusetts Avenue, <laughs> unfortunately. Now, until 19, uh, the late 1940s, British diplomats in Washington, D.C. got hardship pay. Uh, I lived there for 10 years myself, and I can fully understand why they got hardship pay. In the summer, uh, frankly, it's very unpleasant, hot, and humid. Um, that stopped in the late 1940s. And the reason why it stopped in the late 1940s was because of this, the air conditioner. And air conditioning was installed in the British Embassy, and the hardship pay, therefore, was terminated. Um, and one of the things we have to understand is... is, is in part, the history of the air conditioner itself, and the, I talked earlier about how the air conditioner is embedded, you know, technologies are embedded in social systems, the air conditioner is embedded in social systems, and was also produced uh, by them. When the air conditioning was first developed, air conditioner manufacturers were things like promising experiences like, you know, ocean breezes and, and, and all sorts of different, they made different sorts of promises, mountain, uh, high mountain air and this kind of thing. And they were promising very different kinds of environments to people. But these presented challenges for manufacture. Because actually, to mass produce air conditioning, you needed to standardize the product. In order to standardize the product, you had to standardize people's expectations of what was a comfortable living and working environment. And this was done through the development of what are called the ASHRAE standards, the American Society of uh, 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 Heating uh, 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 and Air Conditioning Engineers. And they actually enabled, by establishing a standard uh, level of what we th was is th said to be comfortable for people, uh, they devised a s enabled a standardized product to be produced on a global scale. And, of course, um, uh, it is the, uh, uh, the air conditioning uh, and the automobile uh, that's had tremendous effects on cities in uh, areas that we might consider to be inclement, particularly in the summertime. The sleepy southern town of Atlanta uh, has now become the New York of the South. That would not have happened without the automobile uh, and the air conditioner. And what the air conditioner has enabled is standardized building design. And this has led to a homogeneity of the physical appearance of buildings and cities around the world. So we've had a cultural loss, I would argue. Uh, but we've also exacerbated a phenomenon called the urban heat island which is actually where you, uh, where you build cities without uh, vegetative um, cooling uh, and, without, and where you've got lots of concrete and you're not providing lots of shade uh, and you're not designing your buildings for air circulation, you get a build-up of heat around the city such that cities tend to be uh, at least uh, several degrees Celsius uh, higher in temperature than the surrounding countryside. And that, of course... Uh, exacerbates uh, all kinds of problems in relationship to uh, the production of energy. It increases the demand for energy, compounds issues to do with climate change, which, again, I will elaborate on in more detail tomorrow. Uh, but once again, um, 
we're seeing some inventive architects and engineers looking at the way people traditionally did things and then using modern design techniques and modern materials in order to uh, learn from uh, traditional adaptation uh, to, uh, uh, to, to their circumstances. The building you see at the top there is a Queenslander house, found strangely enough in Queensland, uh, in Eastern Australia. And the purpose of the design, as you can see, is to get 360-degree uh, air circulation around the building. Um, that's why it's up on the stilts. Uh, and you've got these very large overhangs providing shade running all the way around the buildings uh, the, on the verandas there. Now, what happened with air conditioning was that people started filling in the bottom story. Uh, and air conditioning these Queenslander homes, turning them into more conventional two-story homes. Uh, many of them regretted that when the Queensland floods occurred a couple of years ago and those ground floors got flooded because being up on stilts also protects you from, uh, uh, from flood waters. Uh, but you can see how many of the characteristics that were embodied in the Queenslander house are embodied in this building here, which is on the University of British Columbia's Okinawan campus in, uh, in Canada. And you can see the same idea, taking the, uh, the roof with the lots of air circulation to provide uh, shade around the building. Another example is the wind tower. Uh, the wind tower that's illustrated here is a traditional Middle Eastern adaptation. You find them particularly in, uh, in Morocco. You find them in the Yemen. Uh, the idea here was you had a tower that's built above the street level where the breezes tend to be uh, coming along. They're captured uh, in these uh, openings here, and the breeze is driven down into the building below to bring about electric, uh, you know, electrical energy-free, if you like, uh, natural cooling. And uh, Norman Foster took this idea in his Mazdar project uh, in the United Arab Emirates, and he got aero uh, aircraft designers, aeronautical engineers, to design modern wind towers uh, which are highly efficient in capturing any air movement at, at altitude, bringing air down, in this instance, into the public space that's open below, but also actually on a much bigger scale, he also has some of these driving air down under the ground uh, where the air is actually cooled by the lower rock temperatures under the ground uh, and then is used to cool uh, buildings in the city itself. So we're seeing here, as I say, this interesting uh, and promising set of developments. If I'm talking about the impacts of technology on the city, of course, I couldn't do so without talking about uh, this particular piece of kit, uh, which was the one that, uh, along with the air conditioner, shaped Atlanta's sprawl. And it's interesting to think that uh, it was only in 1896, just over 100 years ago, that the Red Flag Act was repealed. And the Red Flag Act was the uh, Act of Parliament which required that the speed of motor vehicles be limited to four miles an hour, and that each motor vehicle be preceded by a gentleman carrying a red flag, which must have taken a lot of the fun out of it. Um, as I say, that act was repealed in 1896. 1896, interestingly enough, was also the year, I'm sure it's coincidental, of the first um, uh, pedestrian fatality involving a motor vehicle in the world. Um, it happened in Croydon, a young lady who was on the way home from a uh, an outing to the Crystal Palace, was run over by a French uh, uh, model car that was being demonstrated by the salesperson uh, and died from her injuries. The Croydon coroner, remember this is 1896, the Croydon coroner is on record as saying, this must never happen again. <laughs> uh, we now routinely in the UK kill about uh, 2,500 people a year in traffic accidents uh, that's the monthly figure in the United States, which also, incidentally, is about the number of people who died in the World Trade Center. Food for thought, perhaps. So it took less than 100 years, though, to go from the Red Flag Act to this. This is actually in China. Uh, in the United States, it probably only took about 60 years uh, to get to this kind of situation, uh, where we can see that the motor car is actually um, dominating the, in, the infrastructure uh, and the, uh, the traffic pattern uh, of the modern city. In some ways, I wonder, though, if that isn't, and, and I think there's an open question to be discussed, um, whether that isn't some cause also for optimism. It does show how quickly we can change from one set of technologies 
which involves a big infrastructural, public infrastructural investment, to another uh, where there are strong incentives, uh, 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 where there is political will, where there is consumer demand to do so. Um, so maybe that's uh, a, note of, a note of optimism that's to be found uh, in that story. The downside, of course, uh, is uh, that the driver for any such change in respect to this uh, particular technology is likely to be traffic congestion. Um, in 1900, the early 1900s, the average speed of traffic in London was 11 miles an hour. Uh, in 2000, the average speed of traffic in central London was 11 miles an hour. Um, that's not necessarily uh, immediately, obviously, uh, progress. And one of the responses to, uh, to congestion uh, has been the uh, promotion of the famous or infamous Boris bike. But why stop there? We all know about the Boris bikes, right? These are bicycles that basically you can go and pick up with a credit card, uh, um, take it out of uh, the stand, ride it where you want it, put it back in another stand, and, uh, uh, and so on. But if we're thinking in radical terms about the car and congestion in cities, uh, I put it to you that thinking about hybrid cars and electric cars isn't going anywhere near far enough. Uh, and I'm going to offer the, uh, the bold prediction, because I won't be around to be proved wrong, uh, that in the next 50 years we will see the private car disappear uh, as an urban mode of transportation. Not necessarily for interurban journeys, but for urban journeys. And that what's likely to have to emerge uh, may well be something of this sort, which is a hybrid between a bus and a limo uh, uh, service. Basically, you have uh, self um, you know, driverless vehicles, which are constantly moving around in the urban environment. Uh, you will simply pick up your mobile phone. Um, I actually put mine away because it, so it wouldn't embarrassingly go off during the talk. But you'll pick up your mobile phone. You'll simply uh, add in a code. Well, actually, you'll talk to it, won't you? You'll, your Siri will have moved on by then. You'll simply tell it how many people you are. Uh, it knows where you are already because of the satellite. You indicate where you want to go. A computer then computes which of these vehicles already moving around, possibly with a passenger in or whatever, uh, can be diverted to pick you up and drop you off at your destination with a minimum disruption uh, to the route of any other user of that module. Um, so you have safety devices inside, you'd have uh, uh, cameras to make sure that people were not being attacked or mugged if they're sharing a vehicle. It would be very comfortable, it would be very safe. Uh, you wouldn't have driver error, you wouldn't you'd reduce accidents. It'd be very convenient because you'd have essentially all the benefits of a chauffeur-driven car uh, without the uh, downside of having to uh, find where to leave it uh, safely when you get to your destination, uh, without the downsides of having to worry about whether you can have a couple of glasses of wine at high table before you drive home uh, afterwards um, because, of course, uh, you're not driving, so uh, that's not an, not an issue. Um, and there are, in fact, people, particularly at Imperial College of Science and Technology at the moment in London, who are working on this kind of an idea uh, for urban uh, transportation, which, as I say, we would envisage would be uh, available, certainly being implemented in uh, major cities, possibly within uh, about 50 years. There are other technologies I could talk about. I could talk about the electric light bulb, um, the... Uh, uh, the electric light bulb, and I could talk about the elevator, the light bulb, which came into widespread use uh, after uh, Edison's improvements to it in the 1880s. Edison, interestingly enough, did not invent the light bulb, uh, but he did uh, improve it. It's funny, isn't it, because we use the light bulb as sort of a symbol of uh, a, having a sudden flash of inspiration and a new idea, but there was actually a history uh, to Edison's invention. Uh, and it was in uh, 1852 that Otis, of Otis Elevator fame, uh, performed his famous demonstration um, of the safety mechanism that would stop elevators from plummeting all the way down the shaft if the cable broke. And he stood on the top of one of them with an axe and cut through it uh, and this patented braking system. And that revolutionized the elevator. He didn't invent the elevator again. Actually, lifts of, of some sort or another were being used by the Romans. Uh, using windlasses and so on, but it was that particular piece of safety um, innovation um, that led to the installation of elevators in increasingly high-rise buildings in New York. The first one was put in 
488 Broadway in the year 1857. Uh, and I put it to you that without these two pieces of kit, uh, that safety mechanism in the elevator and the electric light bulb, uh, we would never, ever see anything like this. This is inconceivable without electric lighting and the elevator. Two mundane technologies which we don't think of as necessarily shaping our cities in the way we think of as large infrastructure systems like roads uh, and, and so on. And that brings me to the question of transitional technologies. What technologies can get us from where we are today to somewhere else where we might want to be in the future? And uh, I'll start off with the one here on the, uh, the left of the screen here, the oil lamp. Uh, do you know why that, I put that up as a transitional technology? Does anybody know? I'll give you a clue. Humanity has only ever given up one energy source in its entire history. Sperm whale oil. Sperm whale oil. Well done. Prize for the gentleman in the middle there. And it wasn't because we were running out of whales or, uh, or whatever. It was actually because uh, we discovered kerosene and, uh, or uh, paraffin, and it was much uh, cheaper uh, to burn kerosene, uh, and it didn't involve so much risk of life and limb uh, to get kerosene as, uh, as whaling did. The key thing to that transition, though, was you could burn it in the same lamp. You didn't have to go out and buy a new lamp. That's an important lesson for us to learn. If we want to move from one technological regime to another, we have to think about how you do those transitions. I put it to you that this thing here, the hybrid car, is actually a transitional technology. And I'll venture a prediction where I think I will be around to answer for it if you come back at me in, uh, in 10 years' time, which is in 10 years, 15 at the most, we will not have any hybrid cars. They will either be electric or they will be, uh, um, for larger vehicles, probably uh, more like fuel cell vehicles. Uh, or we may have other kinds of liquid fuels for fueling vehicles, uh, but we won't be having hybrid cars. It's basically a way of dealing with people's range anxiety, um, which is that most people actually drive fewer miles uh, each day uh, than an electric car is capable of going on a charge, but they worry about what happens uh, if they were to run out of juice. And so basically the hybridity is there to provide that comfort zone uh, in the transition. And as the electric cars range, and reliability improves, uh, the need to have the gasoline engine as a supplementary engine will go away. Um, air conditioners and fire extinguishers. This was a successful transition. Um, you, some of you may remember uh, the um, Antarctic ozone hole. Uh, we had the uh, Montreal Protocol for the elimination uh, of substances that damage the ozone layer. And those substances, chlorofluorocarbons, were used extensively in various applications, blowing insulation foams and furnishing foams, air conditioners, uh, fire extinguishers, and so forth. And one of the things that was absolutely key in the uh, establishment of the Montreal Protocol, which banned their production, was that there was technologically available, there were available technological substitutes for CFCs that could be used in substantially the same equipment with just minor modifications. So it's very important that we understand, that, as I say, there's very little uh, social science work on how we unlock technologies. But one of the key clues probably is this idea of identifying uh, transitional technologies and encouraging them. Some people in the field uh, see existing um, greening of buildings as possibly a transitional stage leading to more radical innovations. Um, this is a building, I think this one's in Singapore, where you can see that the, uh, uh, the vegetation has been used there to provide uh, a lot of the uh, cooling uh, for the building. Uh, and people are now even thinking about the possibility of what they call vertical agriculture. Uh, I'm personally skeptical that we could ever actually feed any substantial urban population in this way. Uh, but on the other hand, the idea that, uh, uh, that increasing population density is a good thing and that people like to garden, and that there are actually good uh, social benefits from people doing gardening. Uh, actually, it's very well strongly associated with lower rates of depression, gardening. So if any of you feeling blue, go out, dig in the garden, get some dirt under your fingernails, it'll do you the world of good. Um, so, you know, there may well be good social reasons why you may even think about having a technology whereby you can provide very high level of density of population but still with access to uh, some of the uh, facilities that particularly we in Britain uh, hang on to much more uh, than our continental 
uh, counterparts, because we, of course, have a very much higher level of people living in, uh, in, in houses rather than in flats. Uh, and the, pres the, the ability to have some private outdoor space that you can uh, garden is one of the factors involved there. I'm coming uh, to a close here. Um, I want to also think about some other potential shifts in infrastructure, um, because it does seem plausible, increasingly plausible, that we may be moving away from what I might describe as linear infrastructures uh, and technologies that rely on things like pipelines, uh, cables, uh, roads, uh, and so on, to point-of-service infrastructures. So if you think about telephones, for example, uh, we are seeing, I think, pretty much the death of the landline for, uh, as far as telephones are concerned. Of course, optic fibers are becoming important in relationship to, um, uh, to broadband, but it's quite plausible that those, in fact, will be superseded uh, by wireless or even fiberless uh, options in the future. Uh, we've already mentioned sewage and water, how we may well disconnect uh, sewage or human waste management from uh, uh, the provision of uh, sewage pipes and wa water to flow down them. Um, electric power, uh, there's people actually investigating the possibilities of moving electricity without uh, doing it along cables. This was, in fact, an idea of Nikola, Nikola Tesla uh, early in the 20th century. So uh, that's one that's been a long time in the thinking. But the, the question for us, I think, at this stage, has to also to be how do we evaluate new technologies when they come along? How do we think about, is a new technology going to lock us into something that we don't want? Or is it going to really enable us and empower us to have the kind of lives that we do want? And there I turn to uh, a very uh, much neglected British social scientist, um, sadly now dead, um, David Collingridge, and his work in the very early 1980s on what he called the social control of technology. And he... Um, articulated what has become known as the Collingridge control dilemma. At the early stages of a technology, you would like to know what its characteristics are going to be when it's fully developed, because then you can put into place the appropriate governance arrangements for that technology, the appropriate um, uh, safety, health and safety rules, the appropriate um, uh, management regimes, and so on and so forth. But the problem is that, actually, when you're at this early stage of developing a technology, the way you think about a technology seldom ends up being the way that technology is by the time it's actually realized and, and, and developed and has uh, diffused into society. So he says you can't do that. But he didn't want to just give us a counsel of despair. He said, what you want to do then is to, wherever you have the opportunity, and you don't always have the opportunity, wherever you have the opportunity to select, select against inflexibility, select against premature lock-in of a technology, select in favour of flexibility. Things he said to look out for were technologies which, have, uh, very high, which are very capital intensive, technologies that have very long lead times from proposal to inception, uh, technologies uh, which are basically create a technological monoculture and crowd out any alternative. Um, think, for example, about asbestos. Asbestos was a fabulous material. It saved countless lives as a fire protector, by being an efficient uh, ingredient in brake pads, preventing accidents and so on. And then we discovered that actually having this stuff spread around all over the place was not a good idea. Uh, and it's now very expensive to try to, uh, to recapture it. Um, so, and the other thing that he warned against was technologies that make hubristic claims. Technologies that, change, that say that they, they are going to change the world uh, in radical ways. He said, beware of these. Um, and perhaps you want where you have the opportunity to, flex, to, to select against those technologies in favour of greater um, flexibility. And that seems like a good idea for uh, city managers as we go forward. So finally, I'm going to leave you uh, with this picture, which is an art installation by the Argentinian uh, artist Thomas Saraceno, who works in Germany uh, largely. And he does these, a lot of these installations. This involves, you can see, there's vegetation. There are um, apparently people, I don't think there are actually people up in there, um, in these uh, very, very lightweight balloons that float. And he talks, his art installations, a lot of them are about cities in the sky. And it's not that I think that literally we're going to take these ideas of moving from the land to the water and then move from the water to the sky, at least not in any time in the foreseeable future. 
But what I think his art does remind us of is that the flexible city is not simply a design problem. It's a fundamental challenge to the human imagination. Thank you.